second half of the first day of the three-day program here uh, <clears throat> in Southern California. I want to apologize to you for the delay in beginning this afternoon session. My good host, Boris, wanted me to take a, a taste of a very nice food in some far-off restaurant. He was impressed that my wife was here with me. I think he therefore, in traffic, we had to go a little distance and got a uh, little delayed in coming back. I apologize on my, his behalf and on my behalf. I was uh, giving uh, answers to some questions, and some questions were left over. If you like, we can take up some more questions, because some of these questions almost become like a new talk, full talk on the subject. So, uh, will George bring some uh, questions, please? Please elaborate why we know the answer before we even ask a question. Where on the ladder of ascent can we dispense with the questions? Anywhere in the lower physical, astral, or mental planes, or above these only? Please elaborate why we know the answers before we even ask a question. Where on the ladder of ascent can we dispense with the questions? Anywhere in the lower physical, astral, or mental planes, or above those only? An answer to this question is that before we can ask a question, we know the answer. Otherwise, you cannot make the question. You can't make a question with no ground to it. Where does the question come from? Examine closely, because this is something people do not ordinarily realize, that if you had no answer, you would not be able to put that question. When I answer, you don't say, well, that's a good answer. You say, oh, that's what I want, to, that's what I knew. Most of the time, when we hear an answer, we say, yeah, that's right. Supposing I gave a totally unrelated answer, say, that's not the answer. That means you know what the answer is. Otherwise, how can you say which is the correct answer, which is not? So that is why we have so much stuff hidden in us, so much stuff not pulled into our awareness. And that stuff is hidden at the physical level. And at the physical level, that means when we are in the physical body with physical awareness, but operating from the mental level in what they call the conscious and subconscious or unconscious mind. The unconscious mind keeps everything buried in it, all your questions and answers, even questions and answers from previous lives. They come with the mind into this life. So it is from there that you are urging to ask a clarification on something that is known there, but not brought into an awareness. So when the answer is given, you feel that you already knew, when the answer is given to your question, you feel the answer was already known to you. And that's the reason why you ask a question, because you know the answer, and that is why you feel it's not necessary to ask a question. So many people have come to me with a long list of questions. And when they sit there, they sit and chat, oh, I have questions also, and they forget it. Once a man who does not speak English, who came to the experiences, is not full. It is reduced because of the covers upon us. And that's why when we ascend there, we can see them in purity as they are. Here we see them covered, so they are a little dull. We don't see them fully. Once a person wanted to know, please describe in physical terms how this works. You say stillness is inside. Stillness of mind, stillness of spirit, that is what will give you everything. What is the stillness for? So the example given was, supposing the moon is shining up in the sky and the reflection of the moon is falling upon a mirror, a mirror that folds like this, that moves like this. And that mirror moves like this, and its reflection falls in the water in the pool. Now, when the mirror moves, the person looking only at the water says, the moon is moving. The moon is not moving, but he's not looking up, he's looking at the water, down below. When the water is stirred, he says, the move is broken up into pieces. 
And if you stir it enough to bring the dirt up, oh, moon has gone away, it disappeared. But the moon is moving because of the mirror. The stirring is being done to break it up and the original moon remains still and intact. What does it mean? The original moon is our own consciousness, our soul. The mirror is the mind. It's a mirror that moves things. There's nothing moving in the soul. The mirror moves the stirring of the water, the waves and ripples are our sense perceptions, which divide everything into different senses. And when we have the complete mud coming up, that's like a body with no awareness what's going on. That's where we are. So how do we do it? Let the dust settle. Let the mud settle. We'll be able to see the moon. Let the stirring stop. Still the water, not the moon. Nothing to do with the moon. It'll stop. Stop moving the mind here and there all over. Keep it concentrated at one place. And you will see the full moon. You'll see the glory of your own self, of your own soul. So that's how the description is given that all these different levels are operating right now but under covers. So they look different at different times. When we are able to pierce through these and see everything, it becomes clear how it's all operating. It does not mean that you will only see the mind when you go to the causal plane. Mind is working here. You won't say you see the soul when you go to Parbrahm or beyond mind. Soul is giving power to everything here including your mind, body and senses. So that is why all these work in conjunction, hidden inside. These are costumes we are wearing for a good act. We are all actors on a stage. We are all players here. And these are costumes we are wearing for different parts that we have. They, they are different. The mind is a costume. We put it first and create time and space. The sensory systems are astral body is another costume that breaks perception into different kind of perceptions. Seeing becomes separate from hearing. Hearing becomes separate from touching. This division is artificial because of the costume. And then we put it all together and have a personality in a solid body that can move around in a world that is solid and material. They are all working together. In the solid body, what we see outside is the solid world. In a physical body, you see a physical world. In an astral body, you see an astral world, not this. In a causal body, you see causal world. They are all different. The characters are different. And you see some remarkable things which you can never see here. I gave example that in the astral body you can fly anywhere you like. That's great. You don't worry about weight loss. Don't take pills for weight loss. You have no weight. You can change your shape with will. Will exercise here. If you exercise your will here, that I want to be thin and lean, or I want to be fat. Not many people choose the second alternative here. But anyway, supposing whatever your choice is here, you go there, it automatically operates. This is an unusual experience. It can't happen here. It happens there. Then you can recall your name is not the name that your body is called for. You had several names. And you adopted a different name for your astral self. You, had, you remember your past lives and you remember you had different names, different bodies. That's not possible right here. So then the time, the experience of time changes. Here, time flows according to clock in one direction. One hour has passed, two hours have passed, 15 minutes have passed. It's only one direction time is flowing, allowing the experience of future sitting somewhere, passing through present and going into the past, only one direction, and we can't stop it. But in the astral plane, you can freeze time when you like. You like a particular thing, freeze it there. We used to play this game when we were children, and somebody, we were running around, somebody would shout, freeze, and everybody stood exactly where they were. Then say, unfreeze, and we would be able to walk. That was a game. But in the astral plane, that's the reality of experience, and people use it. In the causal plane, when you go to the higher plane, you are able to even go, there's no form of the body, because the perceptions are no longer divided. It's a single perception that can perceive anything totally, not separately. And then you are able to, so far as time is concerned, you're able to go backwards and forwards in time, as if it is a pathway like, like space. 
like you're standing on a road, you can go backwards or forwards. That's on spatial movement. You have a complete freedom for movement on timeline. And that's a great experience. You don't have it here. So every experience that you get higher and higher is different and shows you the secret of how the lower experience has been created. So that's remarkable. Then you can also see in the causal plane how the ideas are being made through concepts. That's another interesting thing for an investigator of what is concept and what is idea and what is a physical manifestation of that idea. If you look at that, the concept arises from the causal plane, ideas arise from the astral plane, and physical manifestation comes here. Let's say we take this chair I'm sitting on, or all the chairs you are sitting on. There are different shapes of chairs. But the idea of a chair came from the astral plane, and that has caused all chairs to be made of all designs. Millions of chairs have been made. The idea of chair was one, something raised above the ground where you can sit. But where did the concept come that you need to sit up? From the causal plane. You can see these are not thoughts. These are the originators of how creation took place. You can see the building blocks of this creation around you at all levels. What a great experience. So when we have these experiences, we discover in their purity what the mind can do, what sensory perceptions can do, what the body can do, what the soul can do. You go to the soul, you are above time and space. People say, what about the beginning? Now, I, I can't explain, there was no beginning there. Because beginning means time. The, what, what is the time there? That is the time in such Khand, our true home. Well, I think it's 340. Why 340? Because 340 is what you think is now. And there's eternal now there. Can you imagine an eternal now? People say, live in the now here. And there's an eternal now going on. And no beginning, no middle, no end. How can you explain that? How can you describe what happens when you are in that state? The state contains a strange, blissful experience in which the thoughts have disappeared, mind has disappeared, but that blissful experience is still there with you in intense form. The intensity of that feeling cannot be duplicated here at all, even in the three levels. Of the, of the mental planes. So these are experiences which you go through, you get tongue-tied. You can't speak. Now, of course, I'm speaking, so that means I haven't gone anywhere. <laughs> there is a saying in India by a poet, uh, mystic poet, Bhika. He says, Bhika baat agam ki kehen sunan mein nahi. Jo jane so kahe na. Jo kahe so jane nahi. He says that thing above the knowledge of the three worlds cannot be described. Those who try to describe it don't know it. And those who know it can't describe it. They're quiet. So you can put me in the right category now. <laughs> These are all experiences which you can have and cannot describe. They are, but we try to describe. We just try to describe in physical terms. I try to tell you the truth, we are liars. We're trying to say something is there which is not there because it cannot be described. We want to make pictures of it somehow. Maybe as an incentive, try something and then you say, oh, this wasn't what I thought it was, but you can't tell what it is. Said Shiv Dhyal Singh, Swamiji from Agra, who started the Radha Swami movement, he used to give nice satsangs, discourses, and he used to say, when you reach your true home, you would find tall trees, several miles long trees, all laden with diamonds and rubies and jewelry. Most of his audience was women, you know, for that obvious reason. <laughs> so he would use this as an example to say this valuable thing, very good thing, which you will enjoy. But there is no real way to describe it. So we have, people have used, mystics have used so many allegories, so many symbolisms, so many parables. They have used these because there's no other way to even bring our interest to what is going on. And these are poor expressions about the experiences. So that is why the ultimate statement one can make is the proof of the pudding lies in the eating. Go and see it and then tell, then you can't tell, then you enjoy it. So I am only saying that these 
different experiences, including questions and answers. They come from the mental region, but they traverse through the sensory perceptions and the physical body, and they can be experienced here. True love, coming from our true home, can be experienced here. Because if you keep the mind aside, you will have true love. Do you want to have true love in the physical body while you're here? Put your mind aside. Don't allow it to interfere. You'll experience true love. Because the soul is still working, which, are, which, which is true love. So that is why when we are not thinking about anything and we are putting the mind aside, we can experience the very things that are happening way beyond in our spiritual regions. So try to get the best benefit of this knowledge, this apparent knowledge here, that we can, through certain methods available in the physical body, like meditation, at certain points in the body itself, that we can have these different experiences. So when you withdraw your attention to those points within, you can have unusual experiences below the eyes, through the energy centers. You can have unusual experiences of awareness above, behind and above the eyes. So if you experiment with three things, imagination, attention, and the power to concentrate your attention, that's all. And these are all gifted to us. These are gifts given to us as human beings, that we have these powers and we can put our attention where we like, concentrate it where we like. You go to a concert and you hear several musical instruments playing. You say, I like the drums. And you put your attention on the drums. It looks the drums become louder, others become dimmer. You can't hear the others. Eventually you can only hear the drums. If you just put your concentration on, on that particular attention on drums, it's the same thing here. When you put your attention on being inside the third eye center, the body being just around you, the head being just around you, and you are there and put the attention on that, you will have the same experience which you have by going and listening to the drums because then you will only have experience of your inner self and lose the awareness of the body. So these are uh, all automatically working from different levels. Master, mind does not come in control, even in meditation. Even while doing Simran, thoughts go on. What to do? Please help. Mind does not come in control in meditation, even while trying Simran, thoughts go on. What to do? Ignore them. You can't control them. Nobody controls them. If some people say, oh, we are great meditators, we control our mind, I would say don't believe them. There was a great mystic. He said, if somebody came to me and said, he has been able to drink the waters of all the oceans, it's impossible. But for one moment I might believe it, such a person might exist. If somebody says, I picked it up all the mountains, the Himalayas on my hand, it's impossible. But for one moment I'm willing to accept, maybe such a strong person could have been born. But if somebody says, I've controlled my mind, I'll say, no way. <laughs> that is how difficult it is to control the mind. The mind will keep on thinking and distracting you. The harder you meditate, the more the distraction. You will see the mind becomes most active, hyperactive, when you try to meditate and put your attention away from the mind. So mind fighting. We have given it so much of our own power. We are the life force. Consciousness is a life force. We have made the mind alive. And we have made it so alive that it's become an independent entity. Using our life force, using our consciousness, the mind thinks it's independent. And the thoughts are trying to tell us what to do. Instead of our thinking about what we want to do. We are not using the mind. The mind has started using us. And that is why it's gone out of control. At this stage, to be able to successfully meditate, in spite of this nature of the mind, what one can do is to ignore the mind. How do we ignore the mind? Because the mind is a speaker and keeps on giving us thoughts in words, images. What we can do is to speak back. Of course, using the mind, because we don't speak, we only listen. Using the mind, we speak back and reject what it says. 
it's a it's a actual dialogue that we can generate in our own head that the mind especially for those things which the mind really wants say no way say it couple of times a day three four times a week mind becomes weak and says what good is it trying to fight and then you can ignore it no matter what the thoughts are your concentration will be on the thought you have picked up for yourself and it works so there is no way to control the mind any other way except to ignore it and move on what happens if the master leaves the physical world and you still see darkness within do i need to find another perfect living master to be in the human form to help me and guide me in my meditation what happens if the master leaves this physical world and you still see darkness with it do we need to find another master, perfect living master to be in human form to help and guide us with our meditation the truth is when a human being appears in our life as a perfect living master and we are ready ready means that we are able to follow his instructions and go with it we should as soon as we can do sufficient meditation even devoting little extra time to it to be able to see him to be able to manifest his form inside so that when we meditate we can talk to the master we can ask questions inside and of course the mind can make up the image of the master and say i am the master but when a perfect living master initiates you he tells you the means to prevent that from happening he is able to tell you how to avoid the mind taking the role or any negative entity taking the role of your master he gives you simple methods he gives you a mantra gives you some words use words mind cannot make your picture you can try with those words the mind can never make the picture of the master so with all these safeguards if you are able to have conversations with your master which i now recommend should be started as early as possible even if it's imaginary even the presence is felt and not seen even then start it so before the master passes away in his physical body you are able to have a connection inside and are able to continue that connection in that case you need nobody else except the guidance you are getting from inside and that is enough the initiation you got is enough but supposing for some reason our own lack of interest or lack of uh, enough uh, love and devotion or a lack of enough meditation we have not been able to achieve it we can achieve it even later if he is if he is passed away we can still now meditate harder Master, you gone physically. I could at least talk to you now. Come and talk to me, and I'm still going to apply the same rules of checking out if you are there or not. And he can still appear. Supposing he does not appear, then it's worthwhile going to another master, perfect living master, and getting further guidance. And some people feel guilty. They say, when we get initiated from one master, how can we go to another? as if they are married and it's lack of faithfulness that we are un- unfaithful to our master the tea initiated us and now we go to somebody else so the answer to that is who is the master it's just a human being just to figure out figure out that's not the master how can a human being be intervening in our life and our journey towards god our creator human being is merely a symbol merely a trigger for us to go in the master real master is always inside us from from the beginning and that master who is already inside us is representing the source of our consciousness and appears in any human being that we need at that time therefore the truth is all masters are one in their source they are operating from the same source so they are the same and it is not unfaithfulness to be able to move from one to the other because you haven't had some experience in fact it's expedient that you should do it so that you can now at least before the second one dies or the third one he said don't miss the bus now now that you got a second chance so there in those cases yes you can get help supposing you don't have any master 
you can't even find one and nobody is coming in your life then even a friend of yours who you know is more advanced than yourself can help you get on to the point where you would discover your own master but these are the options that are open to you what is our obligation towards an elderly parent who is aggressive and hurtful toward us and others what is our obligation towards an elderly parent who is aggressive and hurtful towards us and others you can do nothing he is your parent you try you, you run into blind alleys you try and the parent says who is the little little person try to teach me i gave birth to this person i he grew up with me and now he try to teach me so they don't care they won't listen so it's a useless attempt to try to change them or persuade them they are who they are they are going through their own karma so you lead your own life and don't meddle too much with the hurtfulness or the aggressive nature of parents or anybody else for that matter the best rule is mind your own business <laughs> which applies to many situations if we mind our own business we'll be much better off this is karmic pattern many of these things we see are because of old karma a person is hurting you he is not hurting because he wants to hurt you he is not designing i am going to hurt this person never say that he is feeling prov provoked into hurting you something has happened triggered here the actual causes in the past in the past life you hurt that person that's why he's hurting you now now when paying off this kind of karma where you are being hurt either by parent by a, by a friend by somebody who's hurting you or by nature by illness by accident by other problem that you having suffering when you being hurt it's no use fighting it it will come it's your karma the best is to accept it as cheerfully as possible so far as friends and parents are concerned the best advice i can give to their children is best to keep your mouth shut and this also applies between husband and wives when they quarrel <laughs> there was a swami who came to chicago and gave a talk i like this part of his talk where he described in answer to a question from a lady a girl got up and said master my husband and i we fight all the time and we argue and argue and it lead to nothing we just get upset and we both lose our temper we lose our uh, appetite and in anger we say we don't eat we won't eat that's one of these ways of expressing anger i don't like you therefore i won't eat little realizing if you don't eat what are you doing to the other person you are just starving yourself but that happens so that holy man says to that lady i will tell you a story from india a, a woman asked a swami the same question that we are arguing and fighting all the time in the house and the peace is not there we want to restore peace the holy man said my, my little child bring a bottle of water i'll bless it so she went and bought a bottle of water and he blessed it he said some prayer and blessed the water and gave it back to her she said how often should i give it to my husband he said not for the husband is for you and i'll tell you how to use it when your husband starts speaking take a sip and hold it in your mouth <laughs> it should be in your mouth and keep it in the mouth till he stops when he stops then swallow it and if he starts speaking again do it again there will be very much peace in the house <laughs> so instead of saying that if one party keeps quiet the matter ends there he gave a good example of this water, water bottle so uh, i have seen many people trying to bring water bottles to me i thought <laughs> i thought they wanted to think i am thirsty or something no it was their own use so the best thing is not to engage in an argument that is not going to yield anything whether with parents whether with children whether between spouses or whether with other friends the quieter you remain the better they say 
speech is silver but silence is golden then what is diamond running away from there <laughs> i had a little in one restaurant i saw the sayings on one of the paper paper uh, uh, place, places they put place mats and on that one of the sayings was speak the truth but leave immediately after that <laughs> So these are tips given to us by these wise men, and they really bring peace in our life. What is going to happen to the world? Is it destined? Can it be changed? What is going to happen to the world? Is it destined? Can it be changed? What is going to happen to the world is what has been happening to the world for several centuries what has been happening for eras what has been happening in cycles this earth evolved and ever since then we have had rise and fall of uh, civilizations upon it we have rise and fall of the kind of uh, barrenness that has come and great population that has come we have had see all these things many times before same thing will happen again if we look back at history and some evidence that is there it looks like 3000 years ago there were great civilizations in many parts of this earth a, a friend of mine who is a aeronautical engineer he was commissioned by the government in india to make the aeroplanes aircraft for the military indigenously within the country so he visited a lot of uh, boeing and other companies all over the world looking at designs and how they can be made here he picked up some designs and he came and he built the first plane that was indigenously made in india i was working in the government in those days and uh, my boss the political boss told me let's get some man like him to come to our state and build it so he was in another state building airplanes so i went to see him and he invited me to stay with him and at dinner i noticed that in the center of his living room there was a big uh, glass glass half globe like this and there was a book inside i was intrigued what is that book he said this is one of our vedas it's one of the vedas in which they describe how the pilots should run the planes and he had opened that page those pages with instructions they were given to the pilots how to fly the veda are mentioned by buddha as thousands of years old and buddha himself is more than 2000 years old so you can imagine how old that literature is and the literature he he what he explained was look at the, what it says it is giving the instructions to fly between 35000 and 60000 feet high which no plane could be flying at that time it gives instructions for the modern jet planes for the pilots of modern jet planes almost identical to what we give today and more than 3 4000 years old we had planes running like that and after that they all disappeared we started from a little cart bullock carts and horses and came back again to cars and planes it means that there are cycles in which we grow and this, then we destroy ourselves for some reason so what will happen to the earth we'll destroy ourselves and we'll destroy very methodically this time we we we'll destroy in different ways and nature helps us with famines and floods and all that and earthquakes it also helps and we die by disease now we have controlled disease so what will happen next the, the biggest danger is that we can destroy with nuclear nuclear energy that is being stored as weaponry that can be used as weaponry there's so much of it i know because i had little uh, knowledge of what was going on in in my part of the country in india and how they have developed they have nuclear warheads this country is really close to us north korea has nuclear warheads right now Pakistan, next most country, has nuclear warheads. Russia had much, much more. Most of them were left in Ukraine. 
They have 16,000 nuclear warheads. According to our estimate, United States has 64,000. And these can carry hydrogen bombs, not atom bombs. Atom bombs were used to hit two Japanese cities, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They destroyed most of the city, just an atom bomb. A hydrogen bomb, which is different in its fusion, is a fusion, different form of explosion, which is thousand times more, uh, more powerful. It can destroy continents. If one falls on California, it cannot destroy one city, it can destroy a series of cities, one bomb. Now, when you have several thousand of these bombs sitting on this planet right now, and some madman decides to use one, others will try to kill the madman with more. That's what we do. When we say, you are using this gun, I'll use a gun. You, I'll use a more powerful thug. You nuclear, I'll use nuclear. So we destroy ourselves. We've done it many times before. But then some places are we left. Somebody asked me, can you give us a, some place which will not be destroyed by nuclear place? I said, I'm in mind three places. And I write them the names of the places in, uh, in a piece of paper and hide it somewhere. You'll be able to find it because the survivors will be very few. They have been now pressing me. I could sell them at a high price, I think. <laughs> anyway, I'm only saying that there will be places where we will survive. Some have always, always survived and started all over again. There was a documentary I saw which said, what will happen to the earth if man disappears, if a human being disappears from here? Supposing one day all human beings disappear, everything else is there. It, it then traced what will happen after one year, what will happen after 10 years, after 100 years, after a million years, after 100 million years, what will happen? It traced that after a million years, all the buildings will rust, all of them will be desolate, dust will fall, other things will fall, nobody there to clean it up, and animals will start dying out after hundred years it will be very desolate. After a million years, everything will have been wiped out. Plants will be, some old plants will be growing. After, after a billion years, nothing will be left but little, little, small little plants growing on this. No life other, no other life except that. This is based upon scientific study. Now, can you ever imagine? We thought, we, according to Darwin, that we were very late in coming to this, uh, to this planet. And everything was growing very nicely, evolving very nicely. And now, Darwin said, we only came not, not more than 50,000 years ago. He, he predicted first. Then we, there was a family called the Leakey family. The Leakey family were investigating fossils in Africa. And the Leakey family found fossils showing that human beings, human skeletons in fossilized form were there from 10,000, 20,000, million, two million, ten million, now they found hundred million old. That means human beings have been there all the time. And that's why we have been developing like we have been developing. It's the human input into this earth that's holding it up as it is. But when we destroy some human beings are still left to carry on. And the new generations keep on coming, it's multiplying through that. So that is going to be the future but the new way of doing it is that we will be able to build alternative places of residence outside the planet. We will be able to build, I'm going to share with you, you're all my friends, I suppose. You can keep a secret. <laughs> okay, keep this secret and if you tell somebody, tell them also to keep it secret. <laughs> this was a special moment when I asked Great Master this very question. Master, I can't see the future. I, he said, you want to know what happened next year? I know. I don't care what happened next year. I don't even care what happened this life. You told me plenty about that. I want to know what will happen 2,000 years, 4,000 years later. How about 4,000 AD? That's not too far. It's just a few thousand years ahead. And we have had a long history already. But technology is moving faster than other things are moving. Culture is moving slowly, language moving slowly, 
everything is moving slowly, political movements are slow, but technology has taken up a leap and moving even faster every time. It's like an exponential a growth in technology. So he said, you can give a little peep. So I little dreamed like peep into the earth, 4000 AD. I was shocked. There's no population on the earth at all. It's all moved into satellite townships. They're all roaming around. Enough of them, different, different levels. All fully equipped with all means of life. No disease. People end their life according to prescription. Doctor, 65, go. 85, go. Artificial birth, artificial death is very common. Communications are all wireless. They look upon the earth and say, what stupid primitive people were these to build roads, universities, and things like that. They think we are as primitive as we think the Stone Age people were. Because they say, why were this great infrastructure on the surface required when they could do all that in the space? So they feel we are very ignorant people. And they, what is their system of education? No universities, no colleges, no schools. You embed the whole knowledge from all the educated people of the world and gather it in a little chip and, and put it wirelessly into your brain cells. E all are equally educated. All have equal memories. They implant memories. So such a different life than what we are seeing today. Un unbelievable. But that was the little picture. I don't know whether it's a dream picture, whether it was real or not, but it was so different from what we are experiencing now. That could be the future of the Earth too. Master, family and job responsibilities take most of my time. How to progress spiritually? Can you make concession on the 2.5 hour limit? Family and job responsibilities take most of my time. How to progress spiritually? Can you make concession on the 2.5 hour limit? No. <laughs> but I can suggest another way. When you take care of your family and take care of your job, think you are not doing it for your sake. You are not even doing it, that your master is doing it. Do it for two and a half hours, you're done. In fact, great master said, if you do spiritual activity for two and a half hours, and the other activities for 21 and a half hours out of every 24, how can you make progress? With such a little time you're giving, 21 and a half hour other things, sleeping, eating, drinking, whatever you're doing, and two and a half hours you're set apart, it's not balanced at all. The balance is always that you are heavily inclined toward the worldly activities. He said the real way to make progress is to do 21 and a half hour of spiritual activity and two and a half hours where you require your mind to attend to something so concentrated that you have to forget about spiritual activity and do it here. The question was, how can you make 21 and a half hours? He explained. He said, what is meditation? He started from there. Is meditation closing your eyes and looking at the watch to complete two and a half hours or is it something else? Meditation where you meditate upon the truth. Meditation is when you meditate upon the master. Meditation is when you meditate upon God. Meditation is when you meditate upon the self inside you. That's meditation. You can meditate any time. Walking, working, you can be meditating on yourself. And if you don't know how to put the attention on yourself, then at least you have been given words to repeat. Those words can be mentally repeated all the time. Most of the time we are not putting our attention on outside things all the time. According to great master's calculation at that time, nobody actually put so much attention on some intellectual matter requiring so much attention for more than two and a half hours. 
The rest was mechanical. Women were cooking in the kitchen, men were working in the fields, they could keep on doing meditation. So if you do meditation like this, the whole day can be covered except perhaps two and a half hours left out. What about night? You meditate before going to sleep by repeating words. When you repeat words every night before going to sleep, it becomes a habit of the mind. And you can wake up in the middle and find you are still repeating. So you meditate all night. In the morning, wake up, start with the meditation. Even if the actual meditation, what you call meditation, is five minutes in the morning and five minutes at night, but the rest is made a spiritual activity, you are meditating for 21 and a half hours, your life changes and you make progress. So that's how you make progress. If you have a serious job, takes away a lot of your attention and your time, meditate by remembering the Master with love and devotion. The key to growth in spiritual, in spiritual progress the key is how much love and devotion you can express for your master. The more you can express, the more progress you will make. Great master's own master was, his name was Baba Jamal Singh. And he was a disciple of another master living in, in far away from where he lived. He lived in Punjab in India. Another master lived in Agra in Uttar Pradesh, another state. He was initiated by him, but for some time he was in the military. Even after retirement, he was still living in his own village. They would exchange letters. Letters took a long time to reach in those days. They were probably carried on horseback. Even the mail was carried like that. So he one time wrote a letter to his master. He said, Beloved Swamiji, my master, I am feeling that I can't be here without seeing you. I'm missing you so much. Something in me is missing so much. Please give me permission to come and see you. Because he had to get permission to see the master. Then he waited for a month. After a month or so, a letter, a reply came. My beloved son, Jamal Singh, I'm very happy to receive your letter and to find that your soul is roaming around in the higher regions. Shemul Singh said, my soul is not roaming around anywhere. I don't see anything. And maybe this letter is meant for somebody else. So he wrote back to the master. Master, my soul is not roaming around anywhere. I meditate, I see nothing. But I'm missing you. I want to come and see you. That has become so strong that I, I want I, to be immediately at your feet. I want to just come. That's what I'm feeling. He sent that second letter. So... After a month, another reply comes. My beloved son, Jamal Singh, I'm very happy to receive your second letter and very happy to know that your soul is roaming around in the higher regions. He said, what's going on? This Swamiji wrote, so far as coming to see me is concerned, come in the first weekend of the first month, next, next month. Armed with these two letters, he goes to Agra. And meet Swamiji. He says, Swamiji, you sent, you wrote these two letters to me. They are not meant for me. They don't apply to me. I was not roaming around in any other region. I was right here. And all I was feeling was, I was so missing you. I just wanted to be with you. And thank you very much for giving me permission to come. Swamiji said, don't you think those letters were meant for you? No, Swamiji, how can they be meant for me? I didn't have any experience of Kard Brahman you are talking about. Come, let's meditate. So 10, 15 people sitting outside, but these two went inside the hut. And there, for about 15 minutes or half an hour, they meditated and they came out. Then Swamiji asked Jamal Singh, Is it true that when I wrote that letter to you, your soul was roaming around in higher regions? Yes, sir. Yes, Master. I am not asking if you saw the higher regions now in meditation. I am asking, was your soul roaming around in the higher regions when I wrote the letters to you? Yes, Master. Then Swamiji turned to the other ten people sitting there. He says, on this spiritual path, it's not always that the progress that is being made in the ascent inside can be seen inside. It can be seen outside. And one of the signs of it that you're making progress inside 
is the extent of the, the rag or the missing that you get from a master. If you miss him so much, that is a sign of so much love and devotion for the master. You miss so much, you're making progress inside. Otherwise, you wouldn't be missing like that. You don't have those feelings inside unless you're making progress inside. It is when you go inside, you discover that those feelings were coming because you were making progress inside. Even if you go later on and find that the progress that you were making outside, what looked like outside, was actually also inside. So that's how he explained. He said, Master, why would somebody not see inside and only wait for this feeling of missing? He said, because you are having the inner experiences with blindfolds. Blindfolds have been put on, the, on you, on, so you can't see. The reason for that is your karma requires job, obligations, family, other things to be done outside. So you don't miss out on all that and just say, I want to leave the world, I'm getting something inside. To allow your karma to be fulfilled, masters sometimes put a blindfold on you. So although you're making progress, you don't see it. When the blindfold is removed, you see where you were, where you are and when you came. Supposing you put a blindfold on a person, take him to a music hall, he's hearing something and we say we took him to a Did you see it? No, I didn't see. And take, remove the and take him again. Yeah, this is the very place I was in. <coughs> Other evidence is showing to me that yes, I was there. Same thing happens here. So that is why the spiritual progress cannot only be measured by a visualization of the experience. It can be measured by what's happening to you otherwise. Is your anger become less? You see calmness? You have compassion building up? There's so many things that happen in us. Do we miss the master? How much do we do it? How much is our love feeling for others and for the master growing? All these are signs of inner progress, even if we don't visually see it. How do you stop your mind from self-judgment and practice true surrender? How do you stop your mind from self-judgment and practice true surrender? How can somebody practice surrender if he says, I surrender, what has he surrendered? I is still there. Ego is still there. You know, I have done a good job. I surrendered. How can, that, what kind of surrender is that? Surrender does not come unless the level of love and devotion develops to a point that you forget yourself and remember the beloved. It's automatic at that stage. When the feeling of love is so strong that you don't Think of yourself. You're not in the picture. Beloved is occupying your mind and thoughts all the time. Surrender is automatic. So when, when you say, I am going to surrender, you can't. But they say, if you want to surrender, you can surrender your body and say, Master, I'll do whatever you say. Meditation or labor or seva or whatever. I surrender my wealth. I place it at your disposal. Whatever you want me to do with it, I will do it. You want me to spend on this, I'll spend on this. You want me to take care of myself and my family, I do this. But I take your advice on this. I surrender my mind. Okay, I'll surrender my mind. I'll only think on what you told me. One thing is still not surrendered. The surrenderer is not surrendered. The one who is surrendering is the ego. And that's the last to go. But the only way to really surrender that is through such intense love and devotion that your thoughts don't think about you, but think about the beloved. What about genetically created meat in a lab? Would it be okay to eat genetically engineered meat? It is not killed, but grown in a laboratory. The last question for today's session is, what about genetically created meat in a lab? Would it be okay to eat genetically engineered meat? It's not killed, but grown in a lab. Why not eat vegetarian meat then? Why not eat textured soya meat? Why not eat no, uh, wheat? Those were not allergic to gluten. You can make a lot of meat-like uh, cooked food with gluten. 
with wheat gluten. We can make with so many substitutes. Now today, if you want to go to a lab to make your meat, it's so much easier to <laughs> buy grown, plant grown meat is available today. In fact, uh, uh, I have worked with a company. In 1970, I got a uh, fellowship from the United Nations Children's Fund because they wanted to make use of the large stocks of soybean in the United States to make soy protein. Till the 1970, soybean, the beans, main beans, the soybeans at that time, were used only for animal feed. So from animal feed, I was picked up to convert them to food, human food, and to serve it to starving children in the Southeast Asia and other poor countries, Africa, poor countries. That was an assignment I got. I got a fellowship to study this. I went to a lot of companies and so on, advised them how to use soybean. It had some problems. It could not be digested easily. We traced the problem to something called trypsin, trypsin inhibitor, the inner lining of the bean. We found ways to remove the trypsin inhibitor and made it uh, digestible. And then we converted to artificial meat. Then people said, this is not meat, this is the bean. Then we found a method of texturizing it by using pressure and heat. So we put through um, a machine that would um, put heat, heated machines, and also they would move and be pre under pressure. They look like meat, tasted like meat. So th that experiment led to meat substitutes all over the world today. You can go and buy vegetarian meat substitutes. In fact, I'm still a consultant to one of the companies in the Illinois area called Miracle Foods. They are making that. And it's meat eaters can't even distinguish. It's so, so good. So don't go to the lab. You have actually vegetarian meat growing from plants. OK, I am very happy that I spent this time with you. I'll be seeing you tomorrow at 11 o'clock. And I will make sure I don't get late. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.